The, the guard period and also during the activation periods that uh, I was uh, in. Fantastic. And where did you serve while you were within the Air National Guard? I, I started out in uh, Peoria, Illinois, and then I was for pilot, Air Force pilot training. I was assigned to San Antonio, Texas for basic and Bartow, Florida for the primary six months of flight school and then Reese Air Force Base in Lubbock, Texas for the six months of the uh, basic flight training and where I got my wings and my commission uh, and then three months of advanced fighter gunnery school at Luke Air Force Base, Texas. And then I came back to my hometown guard unit in Peoria, Illinois. And shortly after I got back, the unit was activated in the Berlin Wall activation of 1961, which lasted into 1962. And during that time, I served with both the Peoria Air National Guard unit and the Birmingham, Alabama Air National Guard unit, uh, flying F-84s with Peoria and RF-84s with Birmingham, and Birmingham had been assigned, had been activated and assigned to uh, Chamont, France, where I served with them. And then at the end of that, uh, when the Berlin Wall crisis was over and the Guard units were deactivated, I came back to my hometown unit in Peoria and continued to serve with them until I transferred to other guard units. Uh, do you want me to mention those guard units too? Oh, would you please? Uh, I went from the Peoria Air National Guard unit to the Connecticut Air National Guard unit to the Atlantic City Air National Guard unit and to the uh, uh, St. Louis Air National Guard unit. I flew uh, F-84s with Peoria, RF-84s with Birmingham, F-100As in Air Defense Command with the Connecticut Air Guard, and F-100Cs with the New Jersey and St. Louis Air National Guard units in the Tactical Air Command. So. With all these different organizations, different commands, different squadrons, did you arrive at any of these um, via a draft, or did you enlist? I enlisted. I was I was teaching flying in civilian flying at the airport where I learned how to fly in Peoria, Illinois, which was across town from the municipal airport where the Peoria, Illinois Air National Guard unit was located, and I became. Uh, acquainted with the guard pilots uh, and they told me about the guard flying training program through the Air Force which I signed up for and went to but I had 1500 hours of flying time and all the licenses and ratings that I was old enough to get before I ever saw the inside of my first military cockpit as a pilot. And in fact that was interesting because uh, I had to be careful with the uh, instructors that I had in the Air Force because I could fly the airplane as well or better than they could. <laughs> so were you living in Illinois at the time? Yes. And why did you join the Air Force for the Air National Guard? I wanted to go into professional flying and I wanted to have military flying experience if I could qualify for it. And I did and I enjoyed over 10 years of uh, flying military equipment, uh, including the training period. So uh, what were your first days of service like? Oh, interesting. Uh, it required discipline and uh, conformity, but there were good people that I served with, and it was an honor and a pleasure and a privilege to have been able to serve in the military as part of my uh, overall flying career. So, um, what do you remember about boot camp or um, your training experiences? Do you remember your drill instructor? Or in the Air Force they're called... Oh, I, I, don't, I don't recall they had a special name, but uh, 
the thing I remember most about uh, about it was the three months that I spent in basic pilot training down in San Antonio, uh, where for those entire three months, I was not allowed to touch an airplane. And that was the longest that I had been away from flying in what turned out to be an over 51 year flying career. And I used to look up as we were marching down the streets of uh, the uh, base there at San Antonio at an airplane flying over and I'd actually get tears in my eyes wishing I was up there instead of down there marching. <laughs> so how did you get through it those three months? Great, great. I just did what was necessary and uh, uh, what everybody else did and, and it, was a, <clears throat> it was a good experience uh, even if it did not involve any actual flying at that time. So, um, what were the first types of aircraft you flew for the military in a training role? That was a T-34, which was a, a beach craft, and it was a single engine, two-place, tandem seating airplane where the student sat in the front and the instructor sat in the back. And okay. What was your first jet trainer? Then I moved up to the T-37, which was a Cessna, built jet that had two engines and it was side-by-side -side seating and with the student in the left seat and the instructor in the right seat. So you recounted a few different types of aircraft and one, the RF-84 type. Right. So the R, is that photo reconnaissance? Yes. It so, had cameras instead of guns. It did have uh, a set of uh, machine guns on it, uh, but we, we never used them, never trained with them. We were just taking pictures. So what would those missions entail? The phot photographing of air bases, gunnery ranges, uh, points of interest. Uh, one in particular was I was assigned to go over to uh, Germany and do a photo reconnaissance coverage of the bomb holder gunnery range, which they had been trying for years to get the proper scale of photographic coverage of that range and had not been able to get it. Either the weather wasn't good enough so that they could get up to the altitude that they needed to get up to in order to uh, get the scale that was needed, or the cameras malfunctioned, or perhaps the wrong switches were thrown or whatever. But finally, on that mission that I was on, I was able to get the photo recon coverage of bomb holder that the military had wanted to get. And uh, that, was, that was probably my most interesting assignment while I was with the Birmingham, Alabama Guard Unit on temporary duty uh, during the Berlin Wall activation where they had me based with the squadron in Chamont, France, which is in northeastern France, about uh, about 160 kilometers to the east of uh, Paris. Now, is that a unique responsibility? Does every... Now, um, excuse my ignorance, but um, in a squadron breakdown, uh, in, in an Air Force squadron, I mean, it, does it work like the Army? Are there... Are there squads? Are there companies? Like, well, what is the basic building block? <clears throat> they called, uh, they grouped the pilots into what they call flights. Okay. You had a flight leader, and usually there were four or five or six pilots in each flight. And you had your rank in the flight, uh, which is determined by what your military rank was, and that was how they uh, grouped them together. And we had maybe a half a dozen flights in each squadron. And so um, with the, with the RF-84, would that be, would you fall under Tactical Air Command? Yes, right. And what are the differences between Tactical Air Command and Air Defense Command, as you mentioned? Air Defense Command was primarily responsible for air-to-air -air combat, stopping enemy aircraft from coming into a territory where 
uh, we didn't, where the United States would not want them. And the Tactical Air Command was involved in dropping bombs and firing rockets at troops on the ground uh, that were on the enemy side of the lines. And you mentioned previously uh, off camera, but I'd um, like to introduce it again. During the Vietnam War, you were flying the F-100 Super Sabre, which could be considered a fighter-bomber aircraft. Definitely. And can you please describe the, um, the situation and the deployment of uh, F-100 squadrons to Vietnam? Well, I was assigned to the St. Louis, uh, Missouri Air National Guard unit, and there were maybe a half a dozen other F-100C fighter squadrons in the country. And during the Vietnam Gulf of Tonkin call-up, every unit in the country except St. Louis was activated for that period of time. One unit in particular where I had a friend that I kept in touch with uh, that I had flown with during the Berlin Wall activation in my hometown unit, he was a Continental Airlines pilot and he was in the Denver Air National Guard unit and that was activated. It was sent over to Vietnam. His name was Clyde Seiler, God rest his soul, and he was one of the few pilots that did not come back from the activation because he was on, according to what I understood, a low-level weapons delivery mission and he must have taken a direct hit in the cockpit because his wingman said, who was following behind and off to the side of him, said there was no transmission, no attempt to eject. His airplane just rolled over and went in. And uh, that, uh, that was so unfortunate. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, he was the only casualty during, of any of the guard units during the entire Vietnam activation period. So, um, what were the feelings like in your squadron um, when you weren't called up for duty? We wondered what was wrong with us. And uh, finally, after a short period of time, I couldn't stand it anymore. So I called a friend of mine who was in the professional army and at this point he was assigned to the Pentagon and I asked him what was wrong with St. Louis why weren't we called up and he said well I'll give you as much information as I can just give me give me a few days to check it out and he got uh, uh, his information and got back with me and uh, he uh, said they had the number of units that they needed. If they needed one more unit, they would have activated St. Louis, but they had the units that they needed. So that was the only reason that St. Louis wasn't called up. And during that entire period of time, practically all of the pilots in the unit, aside from myself, in addition to myself, all had our military obligations basically fulfilled and we could have resigned in a heartbeat as long as the unit had not been activated. And during that three week or so period of time before we found out that we were not going to be activated for sure, none of the pilots headed for the door. So I thought that spoke very highly for the pilots in the St. Louis, Missouri Air National Guard at that time. And this would have been back in 1967. I was a newlywed. I'd only been married for about uh, three months when the unit was activated and uh, I would have particularly hated to leave my wife if we would have had to had to go over overseas but I wouldn't have hesitated to do it for the country if uh, that had become necessary. So what are the significant differences uh, between the airframes of the F-84 and the F-100? And what was it like um, transitioning from one aircraft to another? Just a matter of going through the school and then uh, going through the uh, training, the physical training program. In the case of the F-84, there was no two-seater airplane, so you just uh, 
talked it over with uh, uh, pilots who were qualified on it, and then the first time he did it in the airplane was the uh, uh, for real. And it wasn't any problem. You knew what the numbers were. Uh, the F-84 didn't have as much power as the F-100 did because it did not have an afterburner. So you took a longer, much longer takeoff roll to get off the runway. Required a lot more runway than the F-100, but uh, they both uh, flew basically the same. Uh, there was no problem transitioning from one to the other. Was the F-100 a supersonic aircraft? Yes, uh, it was the very first of what they called the Century Series airplanes, which had the capability to exceed the speed of sound in level flight. And that was what the afterburner did for the F-100. All of the other airplanes that I flew, you had to go full power and be going downhill, descending, in order to exceed the speed of sound. When you exceed the speed of sound, though, it's mainly just the numeric on the dial of your uh, Mach meter that tells you you've gone through the speed of sound. There's, there's really no sensation or no change in sound in the airplane or anything that dramatically tells you that you've exceeded the speed of sound. The people on the ground know it from the sonic boom, though, which uh, you tried not to be overpopulated areas when you did it because you didn't want to upset the people. It's like a, a huge double thunderclap uh, when, uh, when an airplane in, in excess of the speed of sound goes overhead. So uh, now, in, in terms of um, flight, is there anything that you, on the Air Force, have trained you or advised you not to do while supersonic? Does that affect anything with um, the movement of the aircraft? Or yeah, like you said, that the only sensation is the dial changes. But I mean, is it? Um, is does the airframe get more sensitive at higher speeds? Oh, your controls might be a little bit more responsive. Uh, at the higher speed, but nothing that wasn't immediately and easily adaptable to by the pilot. So what were the training courses like for um, the fighter bomber role? Like when you're training on the F-100, um, the Air Force, I assume, has a gunnery range, a bomb range. What, right. What I, does practice missions be like? I went through training uh, <clears throat> in the fighter fighter school uh, down at Luke Air Force Base in Phoenix, Arizona. And they had uh, a gunnery range which was uh, many, many square miles of area dedicated only to the gunnery. <clears throat> and uh, you were trained by experienced instructors uh, who went with you and uh, you, you had classes of what, uh, what to do and what to expect. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't anything that uh, was not easily adaptable to. So um, while you're in the service and while you're on active duty, how would you keep in touch with your family? Oh, uh, by phone, by letter. Uh, it was no problem. Uh, the, uh, I was still single at the time, so uh, for most of my military flying until the last three years with the Missouri Air National Guard after I got, got married and uh, here on the East Coast. And my first, I, at the same time, I got my first captaincy with the airline that I was flying with in Chicago, Illinois, with TWA. So I had to move to Chicago. And that was about three months after my wife and I got, got married. And uh, I spent seven years flying for the airlines out of, uh, out of Chicago and then uh, went down to, Can had, to trans had to transfer to Kansas City because they shrunk the size of the Chicago base and changed the airplanes uh, up there. And uh, I just uh, stayed with the the guard unit until uh, 1970 and then after over 10 years with the military and Air National Guard uh, units why I 
finally gave up the uh, military flying in 1970 because my family was growing and uh, uh, I didn't want to take additional time away from my family flying with the military in a top, on top of the flying that I was away for the airlines. So um, now I guess now some basic day-to-day -day questions of I mean, what life was like during that active duty. Um, how's the food in the Air Force? Oh, great. I, I just uh, had, had no complaints. I'll eat just about anything. <laughs> mess hall food was always, always good to me. And uh, on the topic of supplies, um, did your airplane, were your airplanes always you know, fully stocked, fully prepared? Were there ever, did you ever want for anything on base? You mean gas, ammunition? No. No, oh, the good supplies of everything. If, uh, that was all taken care of by the, uh, the, the squadron staff. Uh, so uh, that was what went into those ends of the operation. Usually the pilots didn't, uh, didn't see. Now, um, flying these high-performance supersonic aircraft, um, did you ever feel especially pressured or stressed? No, never. You always felt secure in the safety of your aircraft? Yes. And were there any special measures taken? Um, like what would, I know a pilot does a pre-flight check, and what would that usually consist of in the Air Force? Just walking around the airplane and uh, checking for anything that might be loose or any leaks. Uh, those would be obvious signs of something being wrong but usually the airplane is pretty thoroughly inspected by the crew chief before the pilot gets out to the airplane. So the walk around inspection that the pilot makes is just sort of a, a final insurance type thing. And um, speaking of final insurance, did, um, did all the planes that you flew, uh, that, did they all have ejection seats equipped for pilot safety? Everyone except the T-34, uh, although as a, I, I'm pretty sure the T-37 had one too, but the, uh, the T-33 definitely had uh, dual ejection seats, and all of the fighters that I flew definitely had ejection seats, and uh, you just had to, if you had to, I, I never in the 2200 hours almost of uh, fighter flying that I did, I never had the occasion to uh, use the ejection seat. I had friends of mine that did. You had precautions that you had to uh, follow if you did have to eject, which was to, you had stirrups in the seat, in just in the front of the seat that you had to make sure your feet were back into, and you had to <clears throat> make sure that your hands and arms were uh, holding on firmly to the handles and within the uh, within the sides of the seat so that uh, you wouldn't contact any part of the airplane as you went out of the airplane in the ejection process and the either the um, explosive discharge or the rocket depending on which type of system your seat had took you out of the airplane uh, it would take you out fast enough and high enough that you would clear the tail of the airplane without any problem and the design was such that if for some reason you had could not eject the canopy before you ejected with the seat the seat was had a ram on top of the rear of the seat which extended above the pilot's head and it was designed to take out the canopy before you got to it if you had to eject through the canopy. So all the protection angles were covered in the ejection seat system. Now, this might be an urban legend, but um, I heard that if you were forced to eject from an Air Force fighter, you lose about an inch of compression in your spine. Just from the um, physical force and explosive force of the seat, expelling you from the aircraft? I never heard of that. That's uh, probably just a joke then. It, uh, it, it must have been a, a joke or... So that you come out about an inch shorter. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, I don't think that would happen. 
and uh, the the later type of ejection seats, which use rockets to take the seat out, were actually easier on you than the explosive seats of the earlier, the F-84 and the uh, RF-84, because the acceleration with the rocket was not as abrupt as the explosive ejection. So maybe you only shrunk a half an inch. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, was there anything special you did for good luck while you were flying? No, no, just uh, tried to always have a, a good conscience, but uh, that's about it. And um, were the RF-84s and so the F-100s equipped for aerial refueling, or was that something that came later? Uh, they were both equipped for uh, aerial refueling, and uh, we had to practice uh, doing aerial refueling uh, uh, periodically. And that was, that was fun, but it was just like flying formation with the tanker airplane uh, ahead of you. And uh, you just flew up to within range of the, either the probe or the refueling boom, depending on which type of system your airplane had. And I flew both uh, types of airplanes and uh, did your refueling and uh, like flying formation with the, while you were doing it with the uh, tanker. And then when you finished, you disconnected and went on your way for another couple of hours if you're going that far. Was that the endurance of, uh, of a jet fighter, uh, a couple of hours without refueling? Uh, yes, easily, easily two hours. Uh, usually, I'm trying to remember I could if I was on a cross-country flight with uh, the airplane, uh, the F-100, I could make it from, uh, say, Sacramento to Denver without refueling. And then uh, I'd have, then I'd be able to make it from Denver back to the uh, base on the East Coast or back to St. Louis. And um, while you're in the Air Defense Command, as an air, in the air superiority role, was the F-100 equipped with air-to-air -air missiles or just cannon? We used just, uh, just cannon. Uh, I believe there was air-to-air -air missiles available, but uh, as I recall, the squadron that I flew with didn't have them. And there was something unique about the, uh, the gun sight in the F-100. Wasn't it a, something like a radar-operated gun sight? At, at the New England Air Museum, I remember visiting it. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, it would uh, compensate for the distance that the target was away, and the uh, the speed, and whether you were turning, and uh, uh, it had a lot of a lot of good things in it to make it easier to hopefully hit the uh, hit the target accurately. So, among the air forces of the Warsaw Pact, what, what do you think would be the most comparable? Soviet fighter to the F-100? Mm -hmm. I would say maybe the, the MiG-15. I'm, I'm not sure that's going back almost 50 years into my memory files. Uh, and uh, there were 40 years, uh, 1970. Um, and we, I was never in a situation where I had to uh, come up against a um, Russian fighter, but uh, we had to, we did have information on their capabilities and tactics and things like that. Uh, we just uh, had complete confidence that we were better than they were. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, while you're in the service, how do people entertain themselves? Um, entertainment on base? You know, uh, were you ever visited by um, any kind of USO program, anything like that? I don't recall. Usually the officer's club was the most common form of uh, entertainment at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, those uh, nickel and dime uh, drinks that were available those days, uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think that possibly, particularly in the fighter pilot business, why uh, uh, the last flight of the day, the first thing the crew chief would do would put the ladder up on the side of the airplane. The second thing he'd do is shinny up it with an open can of Budweiser and set it down on the canopy rail. And you were expected to chug it before you got completely unstrapped and out of the airplane. And then you'd head for the bar. And if it was a dull evening, you'd take time for dinner. If it was a normal evening, you'd drink through until the bar closed at about 11 or 11.30 at night. And uh, looking back on it with the wisdom of age, why that probably wasn't too good an idea. And it's my understanding that the, uh, the military has uh, uh, tried somewhat to uh, de-glamorize the alcohol side of the entertainment facet of, uh, of it, which is probably a good idea. <laughs> so um, what did you do when you were on leave from service? Uh, did you get any furlough time while you were on active duty status? Oh, on active duty for training, we got, I think, a week off to come home for Christmas. And in the other active duty period, which I was on during the Berlin Wall call up, why we got some free time while we were over there of maybe a day or two or three at a time. Uh, but I was not on in a situation where I went on leave as such because of the, the nature of uh, the situation that I was in. If I had been in a regular Air Force squadron on full-time active duty with a four or five year commitment, <clears throat> then I would have had, had uh, leave periods, but that wasn't something that was available to me because of my situation. And so, uh... Did you do any traveling while you were overseas? I remember you, uh, you were deployed to Germany, deployed to France. Yes, we had uh, opportunities where we could get away for a few days. Uh, I took pleasure trips to uh, Switzerland while I was at, based at Chamont, France, and also to, uh, to Paris. And uh, there, was, there was time to relax and get around a little bit. And that uh, Berlin, Berlin trip that I uh, was able to take before I came back from the active duty period in Chamont uh, was probably the highlight of my trips that I took while I was in the military for fun, for pleasure. And what was the disparity like between East and West Berlin? At that point, could you freely traffic to the East? Not freely. You had to go through one checkpoint, which was the Brandenburg Gate, and we had to be on a military tour in order to do that. And I'm not sure if I could have gone over there as a civilian. I don't recall what the situation was there. I don't think that free travel was permitted between East and West Berlin, or at least not from the East over to the West Berlin side, because I think the Russians knew that if somebody got over to the West side from the East, they probably wouldn't get them back. So what were the feelings like during the uh, Berlin crisis, being an Air Force pilot? Well, we were just uh, hoping that we could prevent, without actually going into a combat situation, uh, the Russians from uh, doing any more bad things toward the West. And we were successful, and I'm glad we were. Now, do you recall any uh, particularly humorous or unusual events while in the service? Any practical jokes? Any things like that? Oh, nothing. Nothing stands out in my mind. Uh, nothing especially absurd? No. No, we were crazy mascots. We're always, always having fun, uh, <laughs> uh, but I can't, I can't think of anything, anything specific. Sorry. Oh, no worries. 
And um, do you remember what your last day of service was like? No. Mm. Like what the feelings were like um, being discharged from the Air Force? No, not uh, not particularly because uh, I was still able to stay in touch with the friends that I had made in the St. Louis unit because TWA flew through St. Louis on a regular basis and during layovers there why I'd always go up to the officers club at the National Guard unit uh, there and a number of my fellow pilots were with TWA were in the unit and also I had have a nine and a half year younger brother that followed in my footsteps into professional flying and he had graduated from Parks College in East St. Louis and he was able to get a pilot training slot in the St. Louis Guard and go through the Air Force pilot training as I did as a National Guard quota uh, student and then come back to the uh, Guard unit, and he flew with the National Guard unit uh, there at St. Louis until his obligation was uh, completed. In fact, that was probably the only uh, sad thing for me in separating from the military when I did because of the need, what I felt was the need to be spending more time with my family in Chicago was that I left the St. Louis Guard unit several months before my younger brother Fred got back from pilot training. So as a result, we never got to fly fighters together as I had hoped to be able to do at some point. But he stayed in professional flying and he's a, a current captain with American Airlines uh, and uh, with TWA before that. and the Ozark Airlines, which are St. Louis based before that. Now, uh, when it comes to civilian flying uh, and professional flying for um, the airline industry, how beneficial is it to a pilot to have a military background if they're looking for work uh, in the airline? I believe that TWA gave equal opportunity to either civilian backgrounded or military backgrounded pilots. The pilots that I flew with, any pilot, after a pilot gets his first thousand hours of flying time, everything from that point on depends on how he is and what level of uh, skill or perfection he is satisfied with. But as to being a good pilot, a professional pilot, the pilots that I flew with who had strictly civilian backgrounds could be just as good as pilots that I knew that did not fly before the military, went into the military, got their training and their flying experience, and then came out. Uh, the military trained pilots could be every bit as good or the civilian training pilots could be every bit as good as each other. And I just considered myself to be very, very fortunate to have had a good, complete professional background in both facets of flying, civilian first and then the military. And uh, you did have another run-in with the military while being a civilian pilot. Uh, can you describe your experiences during Desert Storm? It was uh, very interesting in that TWA was contracted with to fly pilots on the 747s, which I was flying at the time, uh, to and from uh, Desert Storm. And it was, it was a pleasure to be able to have direct contact again with the, uh, the guys who were in the military. Uh, most of them were uh, Army and uh, Marine and ground-based uh, people, but to be able to 
have an opportunity to talk with them uh, in the process of flying them from, I would take them on the segment that took them from Rome to the Middle East and that was that was a pleasure to have contact again with the uh, the military people uh, in that capacity as a civilian transport pilot. Now, so was that airlift conducted with military airlift command as well, or were most of those GIs transported to the Middle East through civilian airlines? That uh, was the the latter. The uh, we were a civilian contract airline uh, to take, along with many other airlines, to take the uh, take the pilots to and from the Middle East. And so, um, after the military, did your experience in the Air Force influence your thinking about war or about the military in general after having served? Oh, I thought it was it was great that. Uh, our country has the military defense capability that it has built up and maintained because there's so many bad guys out there starting with uh, Gaddafi most recently down there in the Middle East that if the deterrent of having a strong and active military was not there uh, people like that would be running all over everybody that they possibly could. So it's a good thing the military is there. And I hope it always is. And did you join a veterans organization after your discharge? I did not. Uh, I, I since I didn't even realize that I had had enough time in the military to qualify for veterans' benefits until just a uh, uh, about a year ago, less than a year ago, and, uh, and I just pretty much uh, uh, there would be occasional reunions, squadron reunions, which I would attend with old friends, but uh, I didn't get involved with a, a veterans organization as such. American Legion or anything like that. Now, um, in looking back on your military career, are there any particularly memorable experiences that you had while in the air, while with your squadron? Like, do any specific missions stand out in your mind? No, not really. I, uh, I didn't have any uh, what you might call exciting experiences in either my military career or my civilian flying career. Um, I, I always tried to have a, a plan B if plan A went to pot and a plan C if uh, plan B fell apart. Uh, you just always try to have an alternative plan if the situation that you're in deteriorates. And then of course there's always the old saying that uh, Fuel is the best substitute for brains that a pilot ever had, <laughs> because that's the one thing that you uh, have to contend with is uh, if you run out of gas, there's only one way to go, and that's down. <laughs> and uh, you don't want to ever find yourself in that, that kind of a situation. <laughs> so you never experienced any kind of mechanical failures? No, no, never had a, I, know I had, I had one situation where I was in a T-33, where I was taking, I was in fine in Peoria, and I was qualified in both the T-33 and the F-84, and I was taking one of our pilots who commuted from the uh, uh, Davenport, uh, Moline, Rock Island area back after he had been there for the weekend, and as I was descending, the uh, engine sounded a little bit funny. So I made what they called a precautionary flame-out approach and landed. And I asked the uh, commander, of the, or I called the squadron on the radio and asked them to send a mechanic out to listen to the engine. And when he listened to it for just a few seconds, he immediately told me to shut it down. And I found out later that uh, half of the turbine buckets in the 
uh, power section of the airplane had failed and blown out and uh, that uh, the engine would not have sustained flight if I had had to, uh, if I had not made that uh, simulated flame out landing pattern. And that was, uh, I had to leave the airplane, it took him about three weeks to repair the engine. And uh, that was probably the closest that I ever came to having an exciting experience uh, in the airplane. That uh, everything else was pretty dull. And uh, in my 51 years of, uh, of flying, just about everything that there, there was out there from Piper Cubs to 747s and supersonic fighters along the way. And uh, I had what I would consider to be a dull career, and that's just the way I wanted it. <laughs> so looking back, um, if you could pick a favorite airplane from your inventory of aircraft that you've flown, what would it be? I would say it would probably be the Convair 880. It was a uh, uh, four-engine, small 707-type airplane, and I have my career smoothest landing in that airplane. One where the a landing where the only way that we knew that we were on the ground was that the airspeed indicator finally slowed down to the point where we knew we were well below flying speed and the main wheels had to be rolling on the runway and one of the things that you had to have for that perfect a situation was you had to be landing on an asphalt runway surface runway that had no expansion joints like the concrete runways have which you can feel the main wheels clicking over those expansion joints every 50 feet or 100 feet as you're rolling down the runway after touchdown and this was an asphalt runway and uh, that was uh, that was the uh, that was the best the best experience in that airplane and uh, that Convair 80 was I would have to call that my favorite airplane but Airplanes are like girls, they're just good ones and better ones. There aren't any bad ones. <laughs> so, um, is there any point of particular pride among a pilot for uh, you know, a certain, you know, reaching a, you know, a zen at the height of your career? Would you say that, that perfect landing would be it? Oh, I would say that probably when a, when a pilot first solos an airplane, for the first time in any airplane by himself. That is an exceptional feeling. When a person goes into the airlines and gets his qualification as a captain and goes out on his very first flight as the captain of the airplane, that's another high point in, a, in his career. But uh, Aside from things like that, I just every day is a good day for flying. There aren't any, there are some days that are better than others, like when they're clear sky, blue sky, sunshiny days like this are better than uh, having to pick your way around thunderstorms with the with the radar and that sort of thing. But just there are, there are good days and there are better days. I uh, in the entire 51 years of my flying career, I never had a day of flying that I went up on that I did not look forward to. And I don't know how many other guys can say that about their jobs. So is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered in this interview? Oh, not really. I think we've uh, pretty much uh, covered everything. I, I did actually feel as though I the one facet of uh, aviation that I did not participate in was astronautics, but I felt that I did that by proxy because when I was flying fighters, F-100As with the Connecticut Air Guard, one of my fellow pilots was a gentleman by the name of Jack Swaggart, 
that went on to become the Apollo 13 command module pilot. And Jack and I sat alert together and flew missions together. And this was several years before he got into the astronaut program. And he did not actually get into the astronaut program directly. He, uh, there was a project called the, uh, the uh, Dinosaur Project, which was the forerunner of the space shuttle. And it was a winged vehicle that was mounted without an engine on top of a rocket. And the rocket would take off with it and the pilots in the winged vehicle and go into space and orbit. And then the device would detach from the rocket and get back down into the atmosphere and be flown, glided down to the runway at the airport of choice and Jack left to become the test pilot on that project. And that was the last I heard of him until Apollo 13, when a, the regular command module pilot, a fellow by the name of Thomas, became exposed to German measles. So they took him off the Apollo 13 crew, and Jack was in the backup crew, and he was the replacement. And that's how he ended up on Apollo 13 and then the rest is history. And uh, he, he told me one time after he got back and we had a chance to talk, uh, he said that when the oxygen bottle blowout occurred, which caused him to not be able to make the moon landing, he said the other two pilots looked at him with a, what did you do type thing. And of course he had not done anything. And. Uh, that was maybe one of the funniest uh, things that, uh, that I can recall. But I think that uh, uh, having Jack on board that flight uh, definitely contributed to uh, it getting back safely, because he was one of the best fellows and one of the best pilots that I ever flew with. That's Anything quite else? An acquaintance. Pardon me? That's quite an acquaintance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so tragic that uh, a few years after he got back out of the uh, astronaut program, he went back to his home state of Colorado and he ran for the uh, uh, senator's uh, seat and he won the election. But before he could actually assume the position, uh, he was diagnosed with, uh, I believe it was throat cancer, and it was far enough advanced that they couldn't do anything about it. And unfortunately, that, uh, that took him. Well, that was so sad, but he's he's up there looking down on all of us, and I'm sure we'll all be together again someday. <laughs> you don't need astronaut wings to get there. Pardon me? Said, you don't need astronaut wings to get up there. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oops. Well, thank you very much for your service. Mm -hmm. I appreciate um, what you contribute to the military and your civilian life, and as well as your interview today. Well, thank you, and uh, I've enjoyed uh, having the opportunity to tell my story to you, and I, I hope that whoever has an opportunity to, uh, to see this interview uh, uh, gets a few chuckles out of it, too. <laughs> I hope so. All the best.